Um, what do you think tonight's event means for the rock industry or music industry in general, actually? Well, rock music is, is you know, in some senses, the last 10, 20 years has become increasingly marginalised by the mainstream. So I think the whole point about events like this is to celebrate, you know, what for so many people is such a special form of music and to try and avoid rock music going the same way as like jazz music and becoming a real kind of niche thing because it's very accessible music and I think it means and I still see a lot of kids at my shows and I know there's a lot of kids that listen to this music still but if you just look at the mainstream media sometimes you, you can be forgiven for thinking this music doesn't exist anymore and of course nothing could be further from the truth so I think that's what makes an event like this so important going to be another wave of classic rock or progressive rock in the future or do you think it'll just keep changing into a new form? Personally I can't see it ever becoming the kind of mainstream force that it was. For me the last great wave of rock music was, hey Steve, how you doing? For me the last great wave of music was Marillion. No. <laughs> No, the last, the last great wave He's of rock music such was... such a nice ass. Yeah. That, uh, Sorry, I'm going yeah, okay. I'm going. Are you oh, at my table, you? darling? I don't know. Oh, OK, I well, we'll find out. I'm, do, I'm doing an interview here. Do you mind? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Sorry. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, the last great wave of, of rock music was probably early 90s Nirvana, the whole grunge movement. But we now live in an, in an age where the media is so fragmented, so fractalised, it's very hard to reach that kind of critical mass. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and particularly with music that's not necessarily, you know, easy to digest. It takes some, you have to engage with it. So I think in a world where life gets faster and faster, we get more and more distractions, cell phones, the internet, uh, we've got thousands of TV channels, thousands of web radio stations. It, it's difficult for me to imagine a time when rock music could ever be such a focal point again that it was in the 70s and it was in the early 90s. So that sounds quite, kind of depressing in a way if you look at it like that. But you know what, people are still listening to the music, we're still making it and that's the important thing. Did you say inspired your own music? Inspired my own music. Um, Did you grow up listening to that? Well, my, my, my biggest influence really was my dad's record collection. And my dad's record collection was full of what was at the time the sort of big crossover progressive rock album. So Tubular Bells, My Coldfield, Dark Side of the Moon, of course. Uh, War of the Worlds, the Jeff Wayne, and these were like big conceptual musical journeys um, that didn't, you know, necessarily have commercial pop songs on, but they were selling millions of records, you know, and my dad would listen to these records over and over again, so I would lie in bed hearing these extraordinary kind of musical journeys, and even without necessarily being conscious of it, I was kind of being brainwashed, you know, that was, that was creating my musical DNA. So when I came to make my own music, I was totally enamoured with this idea of making albums that were like musical journeys. I wasn't interested in writing three, you know, ten three-minute pop songs and throwing together on a record. And that was increasingly hard. When I started it was even harder than it is now, you know, because we're talking about the sort of early 90s and that music was so completely invisible. And I think it is better now, you know, since bands like Radiohead and Muse and Flaming Lips and those kind of bands have come along and they have, you know, they have made some impact in the mainstream, albeit, you know, in the 90s. And I think it did open the doors a little bit for, for musicians like myself to have a career, you know, so I have to, I have to be thankful for that, yeah. Sure. What would you say was the most memorable concert you personally went to? I thought you were going to ask me to, I, that I played or that I went to, that I attended. Um, the most memorable concert I went to... Uh, that's tough. I can tell you what the most memorable concert I played is, which is the... the, the I did two shows at the Royal Albert Hall last month. And uh, that was incredible, you know. Because, well, because it's a, it's an unbelievably legendary venue, you know, and it's fantastic to be on stage in that venue. But also, you know, relating to what we've been talking about, it hasn't been easy. You know, I've been doing this 20 years now, and it has been kind of war of attrition in a way, you know, piece by piece, making fans by word of mouth. So to be able to do two nights at the Albert Hall, both sold out, is kind of. It feels like a vindication to me and the reward for a lot of graft and a lot of hard work. Playing music which as we've already discussed is not easy. It's not easy to put music across that needs, you know, you need people to sit down and really engage with the music. So that felt really special to me, you know, to be able to do 
two nights in the heart of my hometown in the most beautiful, you know, kind of inspiring venue. So that felt really, really special to me, yeah. Thank you very much. I will.